pleasure to be here today. Uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about drug treatment courts and how we have responded uh, to the opiate crisis or the, the expanding uh, um, evidence of opiate use you know, across the country. Uh, now, in order for this to make sense, um, I, I, you have to know what, what a drug treatment court is. And I know many of you do, but some of you are at the beginnings of your careers and you may not have heard of drug treatment courts, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about it. I'm not going to have a presentation. Anything you want up there? Um, <laughs> so, um, so, so, so what is a drug court? A drug court is a court. It's a special calendar or docket specifically for men and women who have uh, uh, committed or been charged with a crime and have been assessed to have a drug addiction, to living with uh, what we now call a severe substance use disorder. So it's a regular court um, for, you know, for the most part for people who have been convicted or charged and then uh, they've been, it's been an assessment done and they've been determined to actually be living with addiction. And for individuals who are otherwise eligible, uh, they participate uh, in treatment. If they get in drug court, the focus of their time in court, in this court program, is to be engaged in evidence-based treatment to address their underlying issues. And, and that's really what the point is, that an assessment has been made, this individual, that, that their, their current criminal matter or their um, um, criminal history is connected to their drug addiction. And that's not true for everyone in the justice system. There are people in the justice system for, for reasons that have nothing to do with drinking and drug. There are people who use drugs sometimes and who commit crimes, but who are not addicts. Uh, that's not who drug courts are for. Um, Drug courts are for people who've been assessed to be living with addiction, uh, and it's believed that their addiction is driving criminal behavior. And so the concept is that what the court oversees, and what the probation officer involved, and what the, the, the advocacy in support of a defense attorney, and a prosecutor who's on board, and a case manager, and individuals who are wrapping services and attention around this individual to keep them on track, uh, to keep them in treatment long enough for treatment to work. That's what a drug treatment court is. And my organization is designed to help support the drug court field, to train drug court professionals, judges, other attorneys, prosecutors and defense attorneys, treatment providers, law enforcement officers, anyone working in a drug court, we are dedicated to training them and helping them um, deliver the drug court, operate the drug court in an evidence-based way. We also uh, work to help expand well-run drug courts around the country. And um, so, 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 you know, drug courts work. That, that we certainly know. There are lots of drug courts. We just did a survey uh, very recently. Uh, there are over 3,000 drug courts across the country right now. Uh, some of them are adult drug courts for adults charged or convicted of criminal offenses. There are also juvenile drug courts, and there are also uh, veterans treatment courts specifically for veterans with either substance use or mental health issues who are uh, who get involved in the justice system. There are DUI courts for men and women who have been convicted of, of DUI-related offenses, DWI-related offenses. There are tribal healing to wellness courts specifically for, for native populations who live often on reservations and who uh, who have been assessed to have alcohol or other drug use disorders and get involved in the justice system, uh, and there are also family dependency courts. These are these are our treatment courts, uh, not for individuals who've been charged for criminal offense, but for parents who are at risk of, of losing their children as a result of the parents' drug addiction. The treatment courts are designed to service them. So. Uh, there are lots of drug courts, and we know that drug courts work. Uh, there have been, drug court is the most studied intervention uh, in the justice system. Um, we know that drug court is the single most effective intervention uh, approach at helping to connect uh, people with substance use disorders in the justice system to life-saving treatment. We connect more people to evidence-based treatment than any other intervention in America. 
and more of those people do better than any other group. And that's primarily because drug courts, with the, overs with the oversight of the court, help men and women and young people stay in treatment long enough for treatment to work. We know that addiction is real. We know that it happens in the brain, not the mind. It's not just in a person's mind, it's in their brain. And, 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 and we know that now. You know, when I was some of your age, they had this advertising campaign out there where they had like a frying pan. And they cracked an egg, and it was like frying an egg. And, the, and that was like, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. And you know, that never worked for me. I'm like, that's a big frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I got what they were trying to say, but it, it, it wasn't persuasive to me. We, we no longer have to rely on egg in a frying pan analogies. We now can see the brain through imaging and see the brain before a person becomes addicted and then see the brain after and see how different it is. And it stays different even after they get clean for a while. And, 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 and it wouldn't matter so much, except the difference in the brain causes differences in behavior and causes people not to be able to do the things they want to do and causes people to do things they don't want to do. And so treatment is necessary and it works to correct that. And drug courts help to keep people in treatment long enough for that to happen. Uh, we, we had some materials over there that of course are gone now that, that give you some of the research on, 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 on the effectiveness of drug courts. Uh, both when drug courts work and when they don't work. Uh, if you didn't get a copy of that stuff, please go to allrise.org. You know, allrise, like what happens in court. Uh, allrise.org, and, and we have all of our resources there for you to look at. So drug courts, um, uh, we, we know that they work. Uh, well, well, they work when they work. Uh, and, and, and here is the reality. Drug courts work when we are when the drug courts that operate are doing the right things, they are, they are incorporating the right kind of, of, of addiction and mental health treatment, the treatments that have been found to be effective with our population. If drug courts are doing the right things, the right kinds of interventions for the right people, then drug courts save money, they reduce drug use, and they reduce crime significantly. A large um, National Institute of Justice study, multi-year study, proved that. That when drug courts are doing the right things for the right people, they reduce crime, they reduce drug use, and they save money. So, but they don't just need to be doing the right things. They need to be doing the right things for the right people. If a person doesn't need a drug court and they're placed in a drug court, you don't get good outcomes. And there are some drug courts out there that don't get good outcomes that don't save money, that don't reduce crime. And that's either because they're doing the wrong things, they're not delivering the kind of evidence-based treatments that, are, that have been found to be effective, or they got all the right stuff in place, but they have people in their program who don't need the program. If a drug addicted man and woman has a single arrest, it's, it's their first arrest, and, and they get caught up somehow, uh, they might very well be able to be treated in the public health system without involvement of the court at all successful. Drug courts are for people who have been assessed that they cannot do that on their own. That if we just send them to the treatment center, they won't continue. So drug courts need to be treating people who need the services, who have a real addiction, and who's, who are assessed to need uh, the structure of drug court in, in order to stay uh, clean and sober. So most drug courts work by far. Uh, the large 75 80 percent of drug courts have been found to reduce crime, and save money. And the ones that don't, it's because they're not delivering services in the right way. And that's more what I'll talk about uh, this afternoon. So let's talk about the opioid crisis and how drug courts are responding to that. That's what this is all about today. Um, we just did a survey. Well, the survey was actually done uh, at the end of 2014, but it was analyzed throughout the year 2015 as being released this year. So. Uh, this is really 2014 data, but it hasn't changed a whole lot, you know, in the, in the last few year or so since we took this survey. Uh, we asked uh, drug courts to report um, to estimate the, the, the primary drug used by their participants. Now, many people who are living with addiction use a number of substances, opiates and stimulants and alcohol and marijuana, 
we ask for the, the primary drug you use, and then we ask for second and third, et cetera. Just, just looking at the primary drugs that are used, we found that, and then we divided this according to like urban drug courts and rural drug courts and suburban drug courts. We found that about 22% of urban drug court participants re report with heroin or some prescription opiate as their primary drug of use. About 22% of urban drug courts. About 31% of rural drug court participants reported heroin or a prescription opiate as their primary drug of use. Uh, and then about 34% of suburban drug court participants. So we see that, that, that you know, on average, if you have that together, there's some, somewhere around uh, 32 or you know, 30, 30 percent or so of drug court participants report uh, heroin or opiate as the main drug of choice. Now that's a big change from just five years ago when we last reported on this. In 2009, that's not on the screen. You can't see it anyway, so it's all right. Just look at me. Uh, in, in 2009, uh, as opposed to the 22% of urban drug courts today that report uh, heroin as the main drug of choice, opiates as the main drug of choice, in 2009, it was 9%. That's a 144% increase in five years. Uh, in in terms of rural drug courts, in you know, today is 31%. In 2009, it was 21%. That's, about, that's a 48% increase. And, and suburban drug courts are where we're seeing the biggest increase in folks reporting opiates as their primary drug. As I mentioned, in, you know, in 2014, or, or in the most recent survey, it was 34%. Uh, in 2009, it was only 13%. So those huge increases have done something. It's forced, first of all, it's got the attention of all of the folks in this room and across the country trying to get on top of it. It has also uh, forced drug courts or to be sure we are delivering the, the, the best services uh, that are required to help these men and women uh, get better. Drug courts combine a lot of things. We've always been focused on evidence-based treatment. And and frankly, in some of the courts, that evidence base has always involved the kind of medications that Scott mentioned and that Kenzie will mention. But in, in, in many other drug courts, it never has. Uh, when drug courts first began, the, the prime, in 1989, the primary drug, some of you may know, was the primary drug that was concerned in our communities and in the justice system like in the 80s and 90s. Which drug? Crack cocaine. Crack cocaine. <coughs> And there wasn't then, and frankly still isn't, you know, a medication FDA approved to treat that addiction. And as we got into the 2000s, uh, the, the big concern, as it still is somewhat today, was methamphetamine. Again, a stimulant without medications that FDA approved to treat. And so drug courts had a history of not really, of, of not really having to rely on medications for treatment because the, the treatments didn't exist. Well, things have changed over the last, certainly the last five years, uh, with the rise of opioid use, drug courts now are in a situation where they um, are embracing many because, many because they choose, they've always, you know, you know used medications to treat their opioid population, and others uh, because they have it in the past, but they have to now, to treat it effectively. Here's how some of the numbers, um, here's how some of the numbers look. The last time this was surveyed officially was in 2012. In 2012, a survey was done of drug courts and to determine how many drug courts incorporate medication uh, in their treatment services. About, and in that survey, about 76% of urban drug courts did. About 58% uh, of suburban drug courts did and 45% of rural drug courts did, and, and the, 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 the average is about 56%, just over half the drug courts allowed medication, the rest did not. Um, we don't know what the, we don't have a, a, a survey to say what the number is today. The White House Office of uh, National Drug Control Policy is right now doing a survey that will come out uh, sometime this summer. It's serving all 3,000 drug courts. You're going to see tremendous improvements on that number as drug courts are, 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 are getting on top of this issue. 
Um, I guess I, I just want to say one or two more things that I think are important uh, to sort of bring this home. Um, you know, drug courts are taking the opiate crisis very seriously. We have noticed from our office a, a, a tremendous increase in requests for technical assistance and training on medication-assisted treatment. And this isn't primarily coming from judges, this is coming from treatment providers who've been treating our population for years, but, but the providers themselves don't have relationships or expertise to deliver MAT. They're trying to get that. We just had a national conference in, in Anaheim, California early in the month. I had you know, five, over 5,000 folks there, huge general session on MAT that was packed. Um, uh, we have a vision that as we move forward, there will be evidence-based treatment available to every drug court participant who needs it, including medication-assisted treatment. And we also want to be sure that no one dies while we're waiting for treatment to work. Because treatment works, but not right away. It's a process. And unlike any other drug we've seen, people are sometimes dying before drug court treatment gets a chance to kick in. And so we, in our adult drug court best practice standards, have stipulated that drug courts should be involved in overdose prevention even while we are treating addiction. We've given very specific guidance that drug courts, to the extent they are allowed by the laws that govern them, uh, should be training uh, participants, uh, family members, uh, first responders, treatment providers, on how to deliver the life-saving drug naloxone or, or Narcan. And that's new for drug courts. We're just saying we know this works, but while we're getting people better uh, and while they are struggling, we want them to stay alive long enough for it to work. Uh, and I, I've given some examples. I, don't, I won't show you drug courts that are actually doing that. They produce these little cars that they put in people's hands saying, this is how you respond to one of those. Here's how you, you keep your, 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 your loved one alive. And uh, a drug court in Cleveland had a, a big rolling out where they, um, where they work directly uh, with providers to distribute uh, naloxone in court. Uh, look at the look at the screen here. Uh, these are real. I'm going to end with this. These are real messages uh, from people battling addiction. This is a letter written from an adult son to his parent or her parent. It says, "Please don't get upset or mad at me, uh, but I really can't move back home right now. Everywhere I look is a trigger for me." And if I move back home, I will go back to the needle, and that's the last thing I want. Another voice, real text message exchange between an adult child and the parent. Says, I'm sorry, Mom. I hate my life so much. I'm miserable, and I feel like I'm stuck. I hate it more than anything in this world, and I hate to see you hurt even more. She responds, well, what can I do to help get you the help you need? Anything. He says, I don't know. And, and that's, the, that's what scares me so much, because I have always been in control of my life, and now I have none. Uh, and then one more, one more voice from the field. This is a letter, a line someone wrote to their addiction. He or she wrote this to his or her addiction. It says, all you do is make me sick, and one day you will surely kill me if we ever meet again. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened to the person. He or she returned to use overdose and die. And it's what happened to the other two. So, so that's among the reasons why this is serious business. Why in the drug court world and throughout the nation, we are getting on top of this to be sure that people stay alive long enough to get better and experience the, the, the lives that we are all striving for. So uh, that's all I got for the questions later. Thanks a lot.